open source has grown, and we have seen that in so many talks since yesterday. And it hasn't just grown in the adoption, it has been embedded on everywhere, on the gadgets, the way we communicate, the way we transport, the way we do business and public policies. Um, as uh, I will quote some people because I find it really interesting to connect uh, people in the conference. So Rich Bowen pointed out yesterday, uh, philosophy has been for open source a privilege of a few nowadays. And a few lucky ones, I, I think so. And Mirko Bowen uh, yesterday as well pointed out that uh, because of the Cyber Resilience Act, open source has been forced to grow from the top down. Um, and Peter, Law just, just mentioned uh, in a few hours ago, it has been embedded in everyone's job. So what, what does it mean, right? Um, I don't want to do quality of judgment here about growing and being better or worse, that's not the point, but what is this debate is about is that because of those changes, it has grown so much, and thank you OSI and Nick here representing, trying to keep up on that definition, we do need well-informed uh, perspectives to understand and navigate through this gigantic ecosystem that open source has become. So, um, this debate aims to ask questions that they are tough and they are hard to be asked, and to open spaces that I hope this is just the beginning because 40 minutes is not enough for the gigantic thesis I was very ambitious to try to talk about. But to understand as a community how can we drive from the pers community perspective this force that open source is that's supposed to become from the community instead of just going with the flow from powerful stakeholders. And with that, I think those what I have to say. Um, I want to thank in advance our very brave debaters, and I will let them to introduce themselves. And this is how the um, what is going to happen now. So we have a very we want to use the debate style where I will ask a question. So we will have three questions. Each. Each debater has three minutes to answer those questions, either contraposing or complementing each other. And they will have two minutes to present themselves from their perspectives, if you don't know them, we, where their point of view come from. And we will have two minutes for them to close up their thoughts. So it's going to be very quick and intense. Are you ready? <laughs> Fiona. Basically, no. Please introduce sure. yourself. So I have two minutes to introduce myself, do I? Okay, I, I try to fill up those two. I don't know if I have enough to say, but I'm uh, Fiona Krakenberger. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Sovereign Tech Fund. The Sovereign Tech Fund is an initiative uh, that is financed by the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action, and we support the improvement, the development, um, and uh, yeah, the maintenance of open source infrastructure. What we mean by that is all those core technologies that are often not seen, neglected uh, until they, uh, because they work and they are not really seen until they don't work anymore, right? So uh, we are supporting work on libraries, um, the infrastructure used for programming languages, developer tools, uh, also work on standards and the implementation. Uh, our goal is to sustainably strengthen the open source ecosystem. So we do that by um, commissioning work and giving out contracts to maintainers, companies, small teams to work on those open source core technologies. Thank you. Lena? Hi, I'm uh, Lena Becker. I'm a partner at Osborne Clark. I'm a lawyer. Um, I've been working with um, free and open source software since the beginning of the 2000s. So somewhat 20 years, <laughs> which is quite long. And um, I work with clients from all communities affected by, by open source, which is why um, in this talk, I feel like a spider in the net. I have developers uh, amongst my clients, I have businesses, and I have uh, public governance institutions that work with regulation a lot. And um, I think the most important point at the moment and at the time we're living in is to combine the 
the need for regulation in so many aspects on an EU level when it comes to IT. Um, uh, you just mentioned the Cyber Resilience Act, but there's also the AI Act and the Product Liability Directive and a lot of other security regulations that will come up and that will create a certain framework in which we can work with open source software in the future. Um, and to combine this with the freedom and the maintenance of the freedom, the, the licenses that we have try to grant, um, that will be a very interesting topic that I would like to investigate further today. Thomas? Uh, I'm Thomas Steenbergen. I am a, God, 20 plus years. Uh, I have a software engineering background, so I went from software engineering to trying to open source something, to founding an OSPO for one company, to, f to doing another OSPO for another company, to now I help organizations with managing open source from strategically, safely, efficiently. Um, currently open to work, which allows me to be very frank because I have no employer that tells me <laughs> to do anything. Um, I do open source management the open source way. So I have now, I lost count how many open source projects. I built anything from ORT to manage, like op automate uh, your false policy, till contributing to open chain, till involved in SPDX and SBOM, till the to do group. I have like a whole long list of, and if it has to do with open source, I'm probably a contributor or a maintainer from it. So let's start with a hard question. So let's start with strategy. <sighs> okay, so what strategies can we employ to reconcile the varied needs of open source? Projects, users, communities, business, this humongous ecosystems, and the overarching infrastructure needed. And I will ask Thomas to start that one, counting. Ooh, what strategies? Um, I, I personally follow what I call the, the triple win. So I look for a win for my employer, the employees, uh, and the community which is really, really hard. I've done it now a couple of times, but it's, it requires a lot of energy. Um, doesn't always work out, but it, I, it's the first thing I always ask when open sourcing a project or whatever I'm involved, like, okay, what is the triple win? Um, if they can't get all the pieces together, then I look if I can get the three done. If not, then most of the time I pull out especially when you have corporate-led or corporate-backed open source projects where basically there's tons of open source that's just being open sourced as, for instance, an on-ramp to the vendor's platform. That, that is a strategy. But it might not be a win for the community because you cannot use this piece of open source without using the platform of the vendor. So the more trickier ones is, again, if you want to do an, 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 an. Uh, so one of the examples I did, we open sourced a 3D mapping rendering library that was built on top of an open source project. And the funny thing was it, it did help the company because by open sourcing it actually, the, the, the users of the company could actually easily uh, use it. It helped 3GS because there were lots of contributions back. So actually whilst we're using it, we're actually making it better. And we adopted a 3D render engine to be also used for mapping purposes. Internally, actually the funny thing was when we, was an unintended side effect, but the two teams that were working on that we're going off the charge in all internal metrics. So time to close a uh, box. Uh, the happiness of the employees, which we call the pulse score, off, off, off the charge. So, but is that the, the strategies, it really depends on project to project, which there's a whole toolbox of strategies I have that I would, that would, that would deploy. There's not one bullet size fits all that will solve uh, everything. Now I'll yield with one more minute back. <laughs> Thank you. Then, uh, Fiona, how would you reply to that? Um, thinking of, because you have like a big public policies around it, how do you mm. relate or not to that? Yeah. Actually, the clock makes me want to go first. That could be the quickest of all. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to, to use my time. Um, so, when I read this question, I want to reframe it or I want to. Um, challenge the question a little bit because why do we need to reconcile the variant needs? Um, I think the way that we look at open source, when I listen to policy making, one of the reasons why policy making might be a bit, you know, missing the point is because it is seen as the open source ecosystem. And I, I use that word too, but I think we have to acknowledge first and foremost the diversity of actors, needs, 
institutions, kind of work that is being done, kind of challenges that we see. Uh, the, the kinds of people who work in open source are just so diverse. There's everything between, um, there's one person, ideally, there's at least one person, uh, to large companies that are have grown around open source uh, projects. So, and those have extremely different needs. And uh, at the Sovereign Tech Fund, we focus on, we, we are a still pretty young organization, which is one and a half years old, so we can still test a ton of different things, uh, and we can try different things, we can learn different things, but ultimately, um, and that's also how we learn about many different needs, and it's very clear to us, it has always been clear to us, that there's no one solution fits all. There's no um, turnkey solution. We, we are one important, um, I think, initiative in this field, uh, and one important uh, element, but we need way more actors because every kind of support mechanism, organization, or approach can offer different kinds of approach and cater to different needs. There are small teams, there are large companies, there are needs around, um, I don't know, uh, legal consultation, there are needs around growing communities in, the, in a healthy and a sustainable way, um, and I think those different needs need to be acknowledged. And one of the, I, I, I personally think the way that the CRA has went um, has shown, I think, a little bit how open source was quickly thrown. Oh, oh yeah, open source exists. Let's throw it into this one um, bucket. And it didn't acknowledge and cater to the, the extreme diversity of people, needs, and realities that exist. So I would say, um, first and foremost, uh, <laughs> we have to acknowledge that we cannot ultimately reconcile all the different needs and we need to find, we need more people, we need more organizations, more actors, public, donations, private, companies, all need to do their fair share because it's a pretty heavy lift to secure the different open source ecosystems that we have and we need um, all kinds of support mechanisms and structures that we can offer. And Lina? How do you, prob maybe from your perspective, of uh, you often have like a, the general perspective, do you think uh, there is any, from your point of view, framework that can help to have a equity within these strategies? Um, yeah, I do. Um, but first of all, I wanted to add to what Fiona just said, because I think that's just the right direction um, where we have to go. And I think when you ask about strategies, there's only one strategy that can work if we, as Fiona um, pointed out, work with so many different stakeholders in, in a community that is often put together in one bucket, um, which is understanding and knowledge. And, and we have to talk to each other and we have to inform other stakeholders about what we do when it comes to open source, what's our perspective um, and how we see it. Often when I, when I work with different clients, I see that whatever I say is um, recepted from a different angle. When I talk to a developer, he understands immediately, immediately what I mean when I say, okay, take care of the licenses when you distribute your software. When I talk to businesses and my, my corporate clients, they say, okay, how much is it? if I take care of the licenses and what's the risk. So it's always weighing the risk against the costs. And, and when I talk to governance institutions, they always say, okay, what's our political benefit behind it? And the questions that, that you have to answer when you, when you work, maybe not only as a lawyer, but particularly as a lawyer, are so different um, that I think the first point to join all this and to, to get stronger as the open source community or the open source ecosystem is try to understand where your neighbor comes from and where Thomas comes from and where Fiona comes from and where Paloma comes from um, and, and talk to each other and, and tell people what you think, what you mean and what the, the framework is you are working in. I think that's the, that's the main point. And um, I do not think that we are at a point in, speaking of the, the legal aspects, in the regulation framework and the development of the regulation framework where this has been achieved and where this has been taken into account when the regulations were drafted. The open source definition and the open source exception, so to say, which is not really an exception in the Cyber Resilience Act and the product liability um, directive are completely different, even though the two acts are combined. The, the product liability directive is the base layer and the cyber resilience comes on top of it and they do not work together. They have um, different definitions of the same thing. Um, and that's 
from a legal point of view, where the problem starts. And I think the cause for that is that there is no mutual understanding and people don't talk to each other. Legislators don't talk to developers and lawyers don't talk to legislators and, and, and stuff like that. So I think um, it, we have to start trying to understand each other and that will help. Perfect timings. <laughs> so let's go to the next question that is about the sustainability of it. And the question is, how do you define sustainability in open source and which issues are pressing to find it? And most importantly, who should be accountable for it? Maybe Fiona, we could start. What do you know? Um, I'm going to be a great guest, this just reframes every question, <laughs> but, uh, sorry about this, uh, but I, I do think we should reframe the question, because I know that this is not how, it, how it's meant, but I think if we continue talking about how can open source projects become more sustainable, we're missing the point about what kind of infrastructure or environment do we need to create to make uh, open source projects uh, sustainable, because it also goes to the second question that you're asking. It may, it opens a bigger variety of questions we can ask about accountability, because um, open source projects, as I said before, who works on these, uh, specifically the open source uh, infrastructure projects that we support, those are not projects, typ uh, products typically, those are uh, incredibly broadly used infrastructure projects, uh, libraries that are virtually used everywhere in this room, uh, in your phone, in this computer, so everywhere, 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 in every product. Um, and I think it, oftentimes there's a lot of pressure on these smaller or small teams or individual maintainers. Um, and I think we have to be very careful when we approach them with any kind of requirements, like um, there was a great essay about our, how I am not your supplier. I don't know if you read it by Thomas de Pierre, uh, who stressed you cannot come up with all these requirements and talk about supply chain uh, security. I have never contracted anything with you. You're just using my stuff. I never signed a contract with you. Um, so we keep on, when we talk about security in this ecosystem, we talk a lot about things that we would open source projects to be, but we forget about the people behind the code who are oftentimes really small teams or individuals who do it in their free time. Um, uh, so th th that's one side of my r response. The other is, yes, we have to think about um, all who has to be accountable, who needs to be part of the um, group of actors that create a more sustainable environment for open source projects to thrive. And there are different ways to look at sustainability. There's definitely the people argument. Uh, we invest money into projects, which I think honestly is one of the most important steps when we talk about this entire like diversity issues and not a lot of people, as uh, I think Pear mentioned before, who is actually working on these open source core technologies. Oftentimes it's those people who are not responsible for care work who can do this beside their paid, well paid day job. So um, we are responsible for creating a, an environment where more people can uh, become part of this um, global community of open source maintainers. We have to create the institutional and organizational environment. Uh, I think we need a culture of creating more fiscal hosts, which is not something I see enough yet in Europe specifically. Um, and we have to create, of course, the financial uh, incentives and financial support and eventually also the policy side, definitely the regulation that is welcoming and um, in part develop in partnership with open source maintainers and doesn't create a hazardous environment for open source maintainers to do their work. So I think I'd rather like to look at what kind of, what is a sustainable environment for open source projects and what does it mean in, in terms of accountability and who should be part of it. Thomas, I, I particularly interested in your opinion on that um, f uh, response because you have both eyes from the developer and from the one dealing with the mediating with the business itself. How would you tackle that? So yeah, yeah, so for me it's quite funny because I said I'm a maintainer myself. I regularly work till 1 or 4 a.m. at night dealing with issues. I have governments, companies that are multi-billion dollar companies running on my stuff. And I'm just working on like automating open source clients. But the, the, the funny thing for me is like, as a maintainer, it's really funny how I see organizations continuously reinvent the wheel. I, I've seen it here, nothing else. I, I saw the Munchkin guys. I've, I've seen uh, 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 pa Paris talk. And I'm just like, why don't we as organizations start working on sharing how we manage open source? 
Because I look at from, I said, I have the both sides. I have the developer perspective and the open source management perspective. And the funny thing is that in the organizations that manage open source, OSPOS, using open source to manage open source, so actually sharing how you manage open source, not the default. It's really funny for me as a maintainer, I get asked by even organizations that have open source management, can you please fill in out this paperwork so my security or whatever f checks up? So I actually look at, I, I generally feel I know where we're going to, but for me as a developer, and I've been pushing for the way closer target, is to actually get organizations that have understood that they have to manage open source, understand like, hey, you need to open up shop. Please stop writing your own wikis. Please stop buying completely locked down commercial tools where if you tell me there's a problem in my open source project, I cannot replicate it. So the good thing is several organizations in Germany, and this might surprise you because they're not the known open source names, actually have recognized this. And unfortunately, this is Germany where we don't probably say things that we're working on until it's like 99% finished. Uh, sorry, that, that's how Germans are. Um, so several of the large German companies have been building tooling in the background that actually works to solve their issues. And the same thing, whilst we were solving their issues, they also looked like, hang on, we now get insights of what open source we're using and then the next question comes up, okay, crap, we use hundreds of thousands of open source components. We can see from the numbers, and, and Josh Brescher from OpenStaff showed some of that at least in every ecosystem, there's 40% has one single maintainer. So 40% of the top 10,000 packages, whether you do it in Node, in Python, has one single maintainer. Do you think we as, now I'm putting on my large corporate hat on, do you think that they like that? No, they don't. The problem is they have absolutely no clue on how to make that more sustainable. They see the problem, they recognize the problem, they in some cases have some funding. In some cases they can motivate their engine engineers to do this, but the, question, the first question is like, where the hell are we gonna get started? How do I identify the ones that are critical, that are falling off in relationship to my organization? And unfortunately then I can put all my developer hat on when I look at the stuff, we developers are so creative in writing software that it's really hard to figure out what the dependencies are, what depends on what, which is critical, what is not critical. So if I look at these puzzles, I don't blame them. For n and so what they do, they put money in the foundation, they put money on the one that screams the loudest. And the funny thing is it's usually the one that's the quietest, that's the one that's usually the critical component. Mm. Now, do you have any take to help us on that? <laughs> I'm afraid I can't help, <laughs> but I can add to what the what the other two just said because I think what's what's missing on top of it and what combines the two things uh, Thomas and Fiona said is um, it has to be economically sustainable um, because we want open source software to be widely used in in companies and whenever there is an issue um, and people or companies, corporates come to me and, uh, and say, okay, we need help with our open source compliance. The first question is always, how much is it? If we give you our code, how much is it to clean it up? And the usual answer is, I can't say. I have no idea how much code you have and what's in it. So it depends on what I get. Um, and it's usually quite costly, that I can say. It's, it's not a cheap thing. Um, and this is only the license compliance part. Um, and there's so much more coming um, with the cyber resilience uh, discussion with the Product Liability Act and saying it again with the, with the um, Critical Infrastructures Act, stuff like that that will add to the complexity of compliance questions. And compliance questions in companies are not only an economic question, they are also a question of personal liability of management boards. If you're not able to make your company um, to organize your company in a way that um, avoids any infringements of any applicable law, you're personally liable as a manager, as a CEO, as a director. Um, and making the legal framework for open source software more and more complex and more and more diverse, because we have different regulations with different 
people who are accountable for what the, the uh, obligations under the regulation are. Um, and we have different fields of law. And on top of that, we have different jurisdictions people are working in and different interpretations of the applicable law in those different uh, jurisdictions. And um, what I see as the most pressing issue for um, economic sustainability and economic success of open source software is that we have to find a way to harmonize the legal framework and to make it more transparent for the users and for the affected stakeholders um, in the community, in the ecosystem, to, to know what they're actually doing. The solution is not to just put a definition and an exception in the regulation package saying open source that's not used commercially is not subject to this regulation. That's the bottom line of what's in the, in the EU package. No one knows what non-commercial use of open source software is. What if a foundation is sponsored by companies um, and that foundation maintains a repository? Is that commercial or not? I have no idea. And I'm a lawyer and I've been thinking about this for a while. So um, think about what, what the usual, the normal stakeholder using open source in their company, in their small or mid-sized company, um, think it's impossible. And I think there are ways to make this more simple and more transparent. And that's, from a legal perspective, what we have to do to make open source more sustainable. So keep on with that microphone, because then the last question that we will make it short and so you all can have us, uh, the opportunity to ask questions. What are the consequences? Why are the legal frameworks that can be a license or public policy so crucial for regulating open source? I don't know um, how many of you know that, but the very origin of open source licensing is copyright law. There wouldn't be open source licensing without copyright law for code. Um, and that's the quick answer to the question. <laughs> it all comes from a legal framework. It's part of a legal framework. And just like everything, we as a community and open source as an ecosystem has to give itself rules to be followed so that everyone knows what the other one's doing. Um, licenses have a specific aspect, which I mentioned yesterday in my talk. It's about respecting the author of the code. It's not only legal, it's also a personal thing and a morality rights thing. If, if I'm um, as an author, if I'm an author of code and I'm, I'm writing something and I find it important that you, if I allow you to use my copyright, have to comply with certain conditions, you have to do that. It's, it's my wish as an author, it's a question of respect, of mutual respect in the community. Um, and, and that's why we need it. And um, without the licenses, and that's maybe something for you to think about at lunch, if we wouldn't have licenses, you wouldn't be allowed to use the code. And you wouldn't be allowed to modify it, you wouldn't be allowed to publish it, and, um, and, and stuff like that. You need that contract. So that's basically what it's for. Try to be a bit shorter. Fiona, do you have a other perspective? Sure. Um, so my perspective is, um, or my, my statement is going to be about regulations that are coming from the EU. I'm, um, I'm going to say it. I'm a big regulation fangirl. I think it's a great thing. We should think about regulations as a way to shape the environment that we live in in the way that we think is best for the public. Um, I, I do have two things to take, two caveats about the way that the legislations came. And I can say this because someone from the commission said this on stage uh, recently in Brussels. They said, yeah, we were so surprised to see so many people um, who were affected by our regulation that had feedback for us. But now we know you're there. So I hope that this is the beginning of a great uh, friendship and dialogue because clearly, like, there was a lack of knowledge, as you said before, like to acknowledge the diversity of actors in the field. You have to know who's out there. You have to understand the subject matter. So it has to be done, uh, you know, in, in, in partnership. And there needs to be consultations, like real consultations, not the ones that you can't, you know, uh, usability-wise are hard to access. And uh, I think the second thing is when regulations come, they have to be thought of. And I think this is a really important thing, specifically when we talk about open source projects and maintainers. If a regulation is coming, it has to go hand in hand with thoughts around how to support people in complying with this regulation. Because otherwise, you're just creating very unfair incentives or advantages for larger players that are able to comply. We've seen this before. And now we're looking at a field of tons and tons of people who are alone, who don't have, you know, who would 
if the CIA had went as it went, they would have shied away from continuing their work because they couldn't, because they weren't able to comply. So how do we create tools, they are technical tools, and approaches that we can create, how to create finance and uh, or funding or any kind of support that is necessary for people to comply with the regulation that is in best case scenario done in partnership with the people affected. Thomas, you have a reply? So yeah, we talked about licenses, we talked about public policies. Um, for, for me, one of the things about that, basically, so, it, on one side, I see it. We had a lot of discussions recently where we have ethical licenses, where they try to put in ethical discussions into licenses. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, please, it's for me as an open source. Manager, I don't see it working. You try to put something in licenses and legal, what doesn't really fit. Then in public policies, we try to have people that have absolutely zero disk, zero knowledge of the open source community try to regulate it, which is. Yes, we try to lobby them. Yes, we try to improve the things. But I'm more like, what I see missing, especially in Europe, is the public-private collaboration. It always surprises me when we, when I work in the US and I work in, in CISA, so when I work on ASBOM stuff, there's a lot of public-private conversation. So there's both sides of the equation. And, and, and is, is it perfect? No, but it's there. Now we come to Europe, and we have, these are solely public sector government discussions. This is solely private sector. They have the same meetings, the same type of discussions, completely separate. And I'm just like, uh, I can understand. I know I can, we have no time to discuss different, but like, it would be nice from a public policy to basically get the knowledge on open source that's happening in the private sector to be used in the public sector. The similar way why the public sector does things for the public good, that it gets translated, sprinkled over to the private sector and that not everything is about money. And somehow we need to find a policy that is in between, that just mixes the, 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 the two, so that basically both sides are understanding each other better, and that hopefully will basically have the organizations, especially private organizations, that have the money, and also usually engineering resources to help sustain it, and then is supported by regulation. So one of the, the stupidest things, which is all across Europe, in your employment contract, the default is that you can't do open source. That's the default. Why? Why can it not be recognized that basically open source exists and that there is it's recognized? Every company now, you have separate policies to, for doing open source. I do this for hundreds of companies and then always the lawyers come forward, oh, we have the standard German template for contracts. Why can't we not just get this in government regulation and just have the baselines and then there's only like health insurance, in the Netherlands, we have all the same health insurance and there's some added premiums on top. Why can't we just do it for open source? We have open source for 20 years. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah, right. Um, two things. <laughs> Directly. <laughs> um, one thing is, if you put ethical restrictions in open source licenses, it's no longer open source. Um, the, the, the main point of open source is not restricting anything. Um, you can use it for good and for evil. Um, and the other thing is, um, the idea of public regulation, um, to me, sounds much more restrictive than the civil um, regulation we have now. We have contracts and each license is a contract and I'm strongly against regulating contracts with um, any public policies that have to be um, taken into account when I conclude a contract. Uh, At least when it comes to the use of the software I want to use. It's also not open source regulated. I have patent clauses in my contracts. I have a labor law that says I cannot work 40 hours. Why can I not have a simple clause? It is technically already in copyright law, but there is why can I not have a simple thing in there? In case you know, notice most organizations I work with in Germany, most of their core open source, you know when it's done? After working hours. So this is a really funny thing where most open source in Germany is done after working hours, but it's also considered the work. You get a really funny discussion with your works council when most of the software development is done after working hours, it is done used for work, this conflict continuously exists. Come on. This is the it has been solved by the German Copyright Act. 
and for you and Oda in Lina Snoke yesterday. Uh, she disclosed that very well. Um, sh do you want to open? For Well, I hope, first of all, I want to thank enormously the braveness of our debaters to be here on stage. Thank yeah. you. And I, I hope this become more common. We need more debate. We need to be able to ask the questions respectfully. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. So it's not like we're fighting. We're trying to debate to find more well-informed and a better, better ecosystem to everyone. So thank you all for participating as well.